Hello, and welcome to Spark Animation 2022. My name is Vivian Liu, and today I'm going to be giving a talk titled Text to Image AI and its Applications for Animation. I'm currently a third year computer science PhD student at Columbia University, where I work with Professor Lydia Chilton at the Computational Design Lab. We work on human computer interaction and specifically human AI interaction when AI impacts creative workflows. At that lab, I get to work with some wonderful undergraduates, two of whom have contributed to and also are going to be speaking today. So I'll let them introduce themselves and then we'll be on our way. Hello, my name is Yingji and I'm a third year undergraduate student studying computer science with a focus in computer vision and graphics. Currently, I'm also working in the computational design lab with Vivian and Professor Lydia Chilton. And I'm super excited to be here to talk about some of the work that we do today. So the topic of today's talk is text to image AI models, which are a powerful new way to create images using AI. These models take text in as input and produce images as output. So here's an example on the screen of a text prompt and an image that resulted from it. We see an ocean in the abstract art style, and we see obviously an ocean as well as characteristics of the abstract art style. So artists and researchers have gotten really excited about this direction, and there's a lot of momentum into looking into how we can craft effective text prompts for generations. In this slide, we can see a wider variety of subjects and styles expressed by text prompts. But these AI generations are not limited to the 2D domain. They can also represent 3D qualities as well. So for example, if I type in a prompt like Pinocchio on a music box, comma 3D render, comma Fusion 360, we can see that these models are really capable of even expressing qualities from CGI and 3D renders, things like lighting, shading, and perspective. There are also ways to incorporate images as input as well. So for example, you can provide images to initialize the generations and steer generations towards compositions that you want. So for example, here we can see that if we provide part of a music box with a transparent background, and if we provide a text prompt, music box with mama bear and papa bear holding hands with a house of hot air balloons like Pixar Up, we can see that even that text prompt and image pairing is able to result in a generation that builds off of that initial image. And that is very cool. So you might be wondering, wow, how is it that an AI is able to accomplish all of this when it is just a computer program. So AI models are able to achieve this diversity of visual concepts in their generations because they have been trained on literally hundreds of millions of text and image pairings. They learn what you can think of as dictionaries of visual concepts that they can access and combine and remix into a near infinite number of images. When I first began working on this topic in 2021, there were few tools available, and the quality of outputs definitely had room for improvement. However, since 2022, a number of different methods and consumer tools have come out, such as Stable Diffusion, Dolly, and Midjourney. And these tools have greatly improved both the quality of the outputs as well as the access to text-to-image generation tools. So much of the design guidelines and findings that I will next present uh, really build off of work that was published in papers that I have worked on, and I'm visually citing them here. You can find them online on Archive or at the ACM Digital Library. Um, many of the works and results were published using earlier text-to-image AI models. Specifically, they were using VQGAN plus Clip, but many of the results remain generalizable. So one would think that it would be really easy to just type in natural language give it to an AI and get a quality outcome. However, trying prompts can easily be a tedious process. Language is extremely freeform and open-ended, and it is hard to predict what kind of image will be returned and how we can guarantee quality outcomes. So in the first paper that I published in my PhD, we addressed key questions about it in a series of five large-scale experiments. In particular, we looked at three questions. The first one is, how sensitive are these models to variations of the prompt? The second one was, how long on average do users need to wait for a good generation? And the third one was, what breadth of knowledge can the user expect a model to understand? So I'll jump into the first experiment and I'll briefly, briefly illustrate the methodology that underpinned each experiment. 
So the specific research question for this first experiment was, do different rephrasings of a prompt using the same keywords yield significantly different generations? For example, in natural language, we have a number of different ways of achieving the same meaning, of saying the same thing. Many permutations can be made from content, filler, and function words. So on the screen here, we see a few prompts that all amount to the same amount of information. Ocean done in the Disney style, ocean in the Disney style, ocean in the style of Disney, and ocean in the Disney art style. They're all practically equivalent, linguistically speaking. We can see that the generations returned all have the same general characteristics, same similarities like color palette, thick strokes for technique, but they all have slightly different compositions. So to investigate this question systematically, we used VQGAN plus CLIP, which was an open source text to image generative framework that was one of the best available at the time. And we generated grids of prompts permutations made from sets of prompts that shared the same subject and the same style keywords, but they were created with different phrase orderings. And so an example is seen on the screen here. We generated these grids for a dozen subjects and a dozen styles, presented them to annotators with experience in media arts, and we had them annotate grids of these images for which ones were either significantly better or significantly worse than the rest of the group. And what we found from the results of this annotation process and experiment was that there was actually no significant difference between the images generated, meaning that there was no permutation or variation of a prompt that was significantly better or significantly worse than the rest. And so that allowed us to propose this following design guideline, which is when you are composing a prompt for a text to image AI, you only have to focus on the keywords instead of the word order or less salient words. And that's great because that frees you up from having to worry about word order or function words or different filler words. So another experiment that I'll highlight from this paper addressed the following research question. Could these text-to-image AI models handle any style? So to address this research question, we pulled styles from existing knowledge bases of art history and aesthetics online. We investigated 51 art styles, which are laid out in this table right here. And we chose these styles to balance certain factors that influence style, such as time periods, culture, whether they were abstract or figurative in the way that that style would represent the real world, and so on. And so that was to give us a good spread and so that we can understand if there were perhaps any biases that the model was pre-inclined towards. After presenting the results of generations created in these art styles to annotators, we found that there was actually significant variance across art styles, meaning that the model was better at presenting and reflecting some art styles compared to other art styles. And so some styles that it did particularly well in were styles like ink wash painting, glitch art, impressionism, ukiyo-e, anything that is on the right side of this graph. Styles that it did worse in were things like dark academia, Dadaism, Mola art, and so on. Things that it probably found more difficult to understand or convey in images. So we wanted to qualitatively understand what are the different modes of success that would help make these styles do well with annotators. And what we found were that the best performing styles tended to accurately represent that style through color and technique. They tended to have consistent and salient color palettes throughout their entire generation, or they were also able to have the appropriate color contrasts that are characteristic to the style. So for example, cyberpunk styles tend to have very neon and halogen color palettes, and we could see these throughout all of the generations that were generated within the cyberpunk style. Now in terms of technique, the model was actually able to find purchase in the right types of strokes and the right primitives that would be characteristic to the styles. So for example, it could choose fine lines for a high Renaissance art style, but it could also choose thick cartoonish lines if it was being generated within a Disney art style. Likewise, if it was operating under a cubism style text prompt, it would actually elicit elementary shapes, primitives that were appropriate to the cubism style or the right dots that would be appropriate for the aboriginal art style. 
And so we were also able to, on the flip side, characterize what are some of the the failure modes? What are some of the reasons why a style would be the worst performing style? And we found that when we looked at these images more closely, the ones that did worst were ones that had incongruencies across the image. And these incongruencies were either emergent photos that were coming out of the generation, which would clash with the art style that was trying to be generated. For example, in this top row here, we see a bunch of dogs and cats that are emerging out of abstract art styles. So that shouldn't happen because there's this conflict between photorealism as well as the abstract style. Or we would see incongruencies where text would start emerging. So for example, in that bottom image that says Dada, we see happiness in the Dada art style and the word Dada is literally coming out. That would happen because sometimes when the word comes out in the image, the AI is fooled into thinking that, oh, this is even more so an image of, say, happiness in the Dada art style. And so that was something that even today AI models are still grappling with. So now I'm going to pivot a little bit. I've been talking at length about text prompts, what happens when you pass in just text to a text to image AI model. But I did mention earlier in this talk that you could also pass in images as prompts as well. You could have an initial image, which initializes the generation such that you can steer the final generation at least a little bit towards what you initially wanted. So for example, when we have an input prompt like painting of a plant, we could also pair it with an image prompt that could be an icon or a photo and get the final output image that we see here. So a key question that that one would want to investigate with image prompts would be, is more or less detail better in an initial image? So is it more important to have larger, more salient details, like directives that you might get from an icon? Or is it more important to have fine grained details, things that you might get from a photo? So that was one research question around image prompts, and we investigated that in tandem with another research question. Do initial images always help, or is it really dependent upon the type of subject that you're trying to generate? So does it matter if you're trying to generate an abstract subject, a concrete plural subject, or a concrete singular subject? So for example, if you're trying to generate something pretty abstract, like happiness, does an initial image really help? Or is it more helpful if you're trying to generate something that has a strict natural structure, something that is concrete singular, like a girl? And in between, there's, there's things that are concrete plural, like things like oceans, forests, fires, and so on, which have less of a natural structure, but are still very present and physically realized in the natural world. So we wanted to understand, do image prompts help all across this abstract to concrete spectrum? To understand this, we conducted a similar annotation study like I elaborated prior. And we concluded a number of different design guidelines. And what we found was that whether there is more detail or less detail is really case dependent. It's dependent upon the subject. So say you were trying to generate something pretty abstract, something like love or happiness or sadness. Well, we recommended using initial images in this case to steer the model towards recognizable symbols. So if you were trying to generate something like love, we recommended helping the model find purchase in more concrete things that could visualize it. Things like a kiss or a hug or a physical depiction of a heart. These recognizable symbols helped make it so that the AI didn't have to choose and you could choose what you wanted to be depicted in the final image. Likewise, we suggested using initial images for concrete plural subjects, things like forests and oceans, because when they were generated in styles, they often had the same canonical perspective, maybe like a top-down view or a frontal view. But if you use an initial image, you could better dictate the perspective that you were getting from your final image. And lastly, for concrete singular objects, like say you're trying to just generate a cute cat or a dog, we found that in earlier models, you really wanted to put in an initial image so that it could help structure the subject. Otherwise, you could often end up with failure modes where you have a lot of distorted subjects that didn't have natural composition. A lot of the work that I presented was trying to generalize from work that I did on earlier models. But to be honest, since 2022, the field has changed a little bit because there has been so much momentum. Uh, there's been a lot of interest because there's been a new outcropping of a lot of new text to image AI models. 
There are so many that I will just name right now. There's Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, Party, Imagine, Make a Scene, and last but not least, Dolly. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about each one. So Stable Diffusion is one of the ones that's been very popular recently because it's open source. It's relatively lightweight in terms of the AI architecture, um, and many people can play with it because it's open source, offered by Stability AI and Hugging Face. And on Twitter, it caught a lot of clout because it was really wonderful at producing very high resolution images um, to very high quality. One of the models that hit the mainstream earlier is Midjourney. So it's a company that also offers um, a lot of conceptual art and a lot of artistic outputs. And uh, it actually was in the media earlier this summer because somebody had actually produced an AI output and won an art fair for it. So they had won some cash prize and that had caused a lot of, I suppose, media uproar. There's a New York Times article about this. And one of the models that I've really worked at length with is Dolly. So Dolly is an offering from OpenAI and I find that this tool is really interesting because there's a lot of ethics work that has been done behind it, as well as a lot of novel functionalities that is offered with it. I think it has a really interesting uh, feature called outpainting, where you can basically start generating one patch of an image, but then move to the left, to the right, or up and down from it, and you can continue generating and making an unlimited canvas, essentially. So what we see here is Mona Lisa, but we're working off of Mona Lisa to generate a new painting that goes beyond the original borders of that Mona Lisa canvas. And so that's pretty amazing. Likewise, people have used it to create completely novel images like this fractal psychedelic-like image that we see here. Uh, this was one of the outpainting examples from OpenAI. And here's another example where we're again extending an old art piece. This one is the girl with the pearl earring. And we can see that we've really gone beyond the borders of that initial portrait to see a scene around that woman. And then lastly, here's an example where a member of the design team at OpenAI had created an outpainting that was a beautiful mosaic. And we can see that it's generated patch by patch, but it's still a seamless generation. And this feature kind of addresses a lot of the pain points that earlier text to image AI models and generative models had in general, which was that they were not capable of generating high resolution images beyond 512 by 512 or 1024 by 1024. So in some ways, this sort of feature is a, a breakthrough in terms of AI generated art. And lastly, another function that is offered by Dolly and a lot of other text to image AI models is the ability to generate variations off of the same prompt. So because at the back end, behind the scenes of all of this, these AI models are operating over images and text as continuous mathematical representations. They can simply interpolate the data points that they're working with and give us different variations. So here's an example where we have this text prompt of dessert made of desserts, comma, award-winning, comma, 4K digital art, but we get a number of different image results from that same prompt. And so that's really cool because we can see that we can go in a number of different directions from the same high level conceptual thought. And there's also other novel functionalities that are literally being nailed down and figured out every single day. So here's an example from Stable Diffusion of a cool concept that I just learned about like a few weeks ago. So this is the idea of textual inversion, and it's the idea that we can give these models a few examples of what we're looking for image-wise and try to train that model to learn a specific concept. So for example, there are two concepts that we see on the slide here. The first one is this idea of kind of a halogen-like watercolor, and so we can see that by passing in four examples, the grid on the upper, upper left, we can see that we can continue extending that concept into new text prompts. So the streets of Paris in the style of S, which is the name of that concept that has been taught. And likewise, we can see this repeated in the bottom row where we give input samples of something that is a little bit grungy in its color palette, kind of vignette-like, and we can see that that style effect and concept is replicated in all of the images um, in the bottom row, even though the actual subject of the prompt is quite different. So textual inversion is pretty cool because it's about learning how to personalize these text to image models to concepts that you want to manifest in your images. And so this idea of having concepts that you train and then concepts that you can later trade with the community at large, like baseball cards, is really remarkable. 
One last functionality that I'll talk about is one that's offered by Meta's Make a Scene. So with this AI model, you can pass in a text prompt as well as a sketch, a napkin sketch of sorts of what you want your image to roughly look like. So in this example here, we have a text prompt, which is a digital art of a cactus on grass in front of mountains at night. And we pass in a, a sketch like the following, which has some color and some composition. We can see that the final output is really, really guided by it. And this is kind of in the spirit of what we were trying to explore with our previous image prompting work. So now I'll talk about some of the moments where text-to-image AI has briefly interacted with mainstream media as well as popular culture. So a story out of this summer was that an editor at Cosmopolitan magazine had used Dolly 2 to create a magazine cover, like the one that we see on the left here. As you can see, meet the world's first artificially intelligent magazine cover. But she had to do a lot of iteration and a lot of prompting to get at that final image. You can see some of the earlier results on the right. She really wanted to have a magazine cover that conveyed a number of concepts like woman, walking on the moon, as well as space, um, but also femininity. And so she would explore prompts in, the, in this vein, and she found that it was actually pretty hard to dictate the composition and get the right characteristics and vibe. And she spent a good weekend doing this, and she has a good reel and TikTok that explains the process behind this. But it goes to show that prompting and really eliciting and getting what you exactly want from the AI is very difficult. You have to see a lot of outcomes before you can arrive at the final results you want to publish. And so this segues us into the next portion of the talk where I talk about some of the application areas that I've investigated with text-to-image AI. I'll be talking about news illustration first. I know it's not animation, but we are getting there. So I published a paper about how text-to-image AI can support news illustration because news illustration is one instantiation of that classic text-to-image problem. News illustrators are given text, they're given headlines, bits of the article, maybe some paragraphs, and then they're told, okay, give me a relevant and eye-catching graphic that captures the essence of this article. But while they have to create these very sophisticated images, they also have to operate under the time pressure of the news cycle. And so we wanted to see, okay, if these AI models are very efficient at providing images, and many of them, can this tool help, help news illustrators, and in what ways? And so we presented text-to-image AI tools in front of news illustrators in a system that we designed called Opal. So Opal is a, a system that guides users through a structured search for visual concepts such that they can translate article text into prompts and then finally into images. And the way that it guided users was that it would provide them with relevant subjects, tones, and styles given the article text and article context that they pass into the system. These automatic suggestions were elicited from GPT-3, which is another AI tool, but this tool is a large language model, so it primarily operated over text. So we would feed GPT-3 some article text and some headlines, and it would be able to handle some tasks for us, like keyword extraction, summarization, as well as associative knowledge of words. So for example, if we passed in an article that was about, say, the psychology of happiness, it would be able to extract keywords like psychology, like happiness, and then it would be able to suggest a couple of visual representations of psychology or of happiness. And then from those words, we were able to construct prompts that we would pass into VQGAM plus clip. So now I'm gonna illustrate the workflow with an example in this video. I'm gonna be talking about it, of course, with respect to news illustration, but I'll really try to, to say in places where it can generalize the animation. So firstly, when users would interact with the system, they had an area where you could put in text. So this would be where they could put in the headline of the article or paragraphs from the article text, and then they could hit the get keywords button and get keywords that would summarize that article. At the same time, you can see how this might apply for animation if you have a movie script or a storyboard or any kind of idea that is in the text form. You could put that into the system and the AI tool, GPT-3, could pull out keywords that could help you summarize your idea. So then the text to image AI system would retrieve a first generation that might correspond to the article headline as the prompt, and they would also return these keywords. And these keywords were selected 
by the user if they were relevant or potentially good subjects for their news illustration. So then they would proceed to the next stage of the workflow where they would see these chosen subjects generated in a number of different styles. These default styles that we set in the system were photo, painting, and collage, and we chose them because the text-to-image AI models were pretty good at producing generations in those styles. In a next step of the workflow from there, users would choose icons related to the subjects that they had chosen. And the reason why we chose to expand on the subjects that users saw was because they could see a wider variety of related subjects to put into the illustration. So for example, marine life was one of the keywords and subjects that was chosen in an earlier stage, but that could have been expanded into a more concrete image of say a whale as a visual representation of the idea of marine life. And then in the next section, we would take a more conceptual pivot and explore tones of the article, which is a different angle for how we could incorporate the news article into the news illustration. So the system would automatically extract tones from the news article, and from there, users could select, the, again, the tones that they wanted to visualize, and they could also explore icons related to those tones and see a variety of visual representations for article emotions and tones. And so we can see how this might apply in animation as well if you want to have some kind of emotional tenor in your, in your animation. For example, a nostalgic vibe or a very happy frenetic energy. You could use text-to-image AI models to brainstorm concepts that could help you express those types of moods and ambiances. And so we also had a last section that would focus on style exploration so that you don't have to just sit with the default styles that our system provided. So for any given subject, we were able to recommend a number of different diverse styles to really cover a stylistic range within the text-to-image AI outputs. And lastly, we had a section within our system where we would provide a place for users to freely construct their prompts such that they can combine the subjects and styles that worked for them in previous iterations or put in whatever they wanted. And to really study the efficacy of OPAL and its structured suggestions, we conducted what is called a within subjects experiment, where we had users interact with two versions of the system, one full and one partially ablated. And we had them illustrate for two different articles. And in our evaluation, we showed that OPAL really generated diverse sets of news illustrations that could be used in three ways. They could be used as is, they could be used as visual assets, and they could also be used as conceptual ideas. What we found with statistical significance was that users with OPAL were over two times more efficient at generation and also at generating usable results than users without it. And what we also found qualitatively was that OPAL was really wonderful at structuring exploration for artists and that they really enjoyed the way that it helped them build up a gallery of visual concepts. So in the discussion of this paper, we talk about how generating more can be one of the easiest best practices for interacting with generative AI. Because when you see more images, you allow the user to have a better understanding of AI capabilities and to build that mental model over time of what they want to rely on the AI for. And we also talk about how multiple general purpose AI models can be integrated in one workflow. Because here we concatenated the inputs and outputs of GPT-3 as well as VQGAN plus CLIP. And lastly, a note that I really want to hammer home um, to all the animators that I'm speaking to is that generative AI should really be used to augment rather than to replace designers or animators or any creative. It's definitely the intention to figure out ways and points in a workflow where the generative AI can help people and alleviate them of their pain points rather than to figure out, oh, how can the AI do their job instead? I'm not going to pretend that I completely understand the animation pipeline workflow, but I do know that there are definitely places where the expansive capacity of these text-to-image AI models can be extremely helpful. I'm going to elaborate first some of the use cases that I see for animation from insights of the previous paper. So a first use case is that you can be continually inspired without worrying about copyright. This was something that one participant of our user study had mentioned. So in an animation context, let's say you wanna generate a cityscape that's similar to the San Francisco Tokyo Cross that was in Big Hero 6. So you start turning to Google and you search San Francisco Tokyo animation and you see a lot of images of what concept art and concepts people have already created and worked with. So the problem is that by looking at what has already been done on different sites, 
you already see what other people have staked out creatively. And now one worry that you might have is that you could be subconsciously influenced by it. And if you illustrate or animate based off the impressions of what you've seen, you might actually overstep in terms of copyright. So that was the concern that one of the participants had whenever she was scrolling through Pinterest or Google images. And so the extensive inspiration search that an animator might have to go through may often give you more constraints actually than assistance. So something that the news illustrator had mentioned during the user study was that they really liked that they didn't have to worry about copyright with these text to image AI tools. They knew that the images that were generated were completely novel and the AI's output. So they didn't have to worry about taking someone else's artistic idea. And they could take that image as inspiration or something to trace over. Now, of course, if you're generating a slightly different prompt, like a frog on a lily pad in the style of Claude Monet, this would definitely be a more nuanced question about copyright. Um, but I will say that it's also a very open question because text to image AI and AI in general is such a new frontier in law and intellectual property. Another point that I want to mention that was brought up by participants in our user study was that even when they had a concept already in mind, they were still able to utilize the text to image AI generators to really enrich it. So one illustrator had this goal in mind of illustrating a glowing heart. While they had that initial amorphous thought, they were able to establish more concrete elements about it. They were able to see a bunch of nature images and leaves and vines and think about different ways that they could incorporate nature as elements of their final composition. And they also thought about different ways that they could texture their image or also express the glow through different neon contrasts. So that was one use case, being able to complement goals that designers already had. But now I'll talk about another use case where designers can become more efficient and animators can become more efficient about generating 3D assets and scenes. So for example, imagine you're animating a birthday animation and it's a birthday party and people are dancing and there's lots of characters and so it's a very populated scene. But you as an animator really want to focus on the character's expression and the motion of the dance movements perhaps, but you still need to render out a lot of other 3D components. One thing you could do is you could go online and pick out a lot of different chairs, tables, and balloons, uh, a lot of different furniture from different 3D asset packs on TurboSquid and so forth. But the thing is, that would A, be very expensive, and B, you would have to collect a lot of different asset packs, a lot of different assets, probably of a number of artistic styles. So one way that we can see text to image AI helping here is you could potentially just use text prompts to generate concepts of furniture that are all within the same style. And you could get these very, very cohesive concepts within your furniture and within your scene so that you could pass those designs and sketches off to a 3D designer and they could actualize those furniture and 3D assets while you could handle um, a different portion of the animation, the stuff that you want to do, like say the character expressions and the dancing movements. So in this case, you can use the text to image AI to improve your efficiency and to better handle 3D asset creation. And lastly, another use case that is closely related to this this one that I just mentioned, is you can use these text to image AI to quickly iterate on character concepts. So maybe you've been drawing a number of different sketches of say, a new pineapple home for SpongeBob SquarePants, and your team wants you to present a dozen ideas. You might be able to come up with the first six ideas very easily, but the next six might be really challenging. And that's because a documented phenomenon within design and animation illustration in general is that you have design fixation after you're forced to come up with a number of solutions. So reaching 12 solutions might be really difficult on your own, but if you have an AI generator on your side, you might be able to generate on demand as many ideas as you like. And you basically have inspirational toilet paper, so to speak, and you could really minimize a lot of the cognitive burden that comes with idea generation. And AI models in general have proven to be extremely excellent at inspiration and idea generation because they have a lot of breath in their pre-training and because the handoff between an idea and execution is a very reasonable point of handoff between an AI agent and a person. And lastly, we'll talk about a use case where you can use these text to image AI models to really elicit more nuances in terms of the emotional tenor and tone of your images. I will let my co-speaker Yingji talk about this work and then she'll elaborate on a few of text to image animation use cases of her own. Thank you, Vivian.
I'll be talking a little bit more about another use case of AI models, specifically in generating images with nuance, tone, and atmosphere. Especially for animation, creating narrative through imagery is really important, and this can be reflected within the images generated by AI systems. Today, I'll be specifically talking about Dolly. Suppose you want to create a scene of a picnic. In this case, the prompt given to Dolly would be picnic your way around New York City, digital painting. However, you also want to situate this scene within a narrative context. Perhaps it's a joyful and happy picnic. In this case, I'll take the standard prompt picnic your way around New York City, digital painting, and add in an adjective, in this case, happy, to create a final input prompt of picnic your way around New York City, happy, digital painting. Through the addition of the adjective happy within the text prompt given, the AI model is able to direct its output to a bright and cheery image. This process of adding descriptive adjectives can be utilized to elicit a specific tone or mood. Perhaps instead of a happy picnic, the event is more sad. In this case, adding the word gloomy causes the AI model to pivot towards depicting a much more somber meal at the park. Notice how in both of these prompts, the subject of the image is preserved, in this case, a picnic and the New York City skyline, while mainly the color scheme changes. The AI model is able to maintain the subject matter while adjusting for mood through different artistic techniques. However, these systems start to struggle when more nuanced or ambiguous adjective keywords are used. A lethargic picnic, for example, doesn't look too different from a happy picnic. When given these images, it's hard to tell whether they're lethargic, happy, sunny, cozy, or a different sort of mood. The nuance of the adjective isn't as apparent within the generated images. Thus, to access higher level of nuance, we turn towards specifying artistic techniques. There's a lot of visual techniques that artists use to help convey different moods and tones, and specifically, I'll be giving two examples using color keywords and lighting keywords. Rather than adding an adjective to directly specify an emotion, we can use color keywords and lighting keywords to help adjust for various themes. This can be achieved through a similar manner as adding adjectives to written prompts. This time, instead of adding an adjective to our standard base prompt, we add a color keyword instead. In this case, I'm adding warm colors. So for a standard prompt, of an ocean, I create a final input prompt of ocean, warm colors, digital painting. When applied to a specific subject, it can help convey moods such as warmth using warm colors, wonder when using vibrant colors, or foreboding when using desaturated colors. These moods and atmospheres can be difficult to achieve through simply specifying the adjectives. Within the animation workflow, these prompting techniques could aid artists in quickly brainstorming and comparing various factors that can affect the mood for specific scenes. Similar to adjective and color keywords, descriptions of light can also be used to showcase scenes at different times of day or under different lighting conditions. In this case, Using a standard base prompt of river digital painting, I can add in a lighting keyword such as moonlight to create a final input prompt of river moonlight digital painting. Using this, I can create images of the same location or the same scene throughout different times of the day. In this case, using keywords of dawn, sunrise, sunny to indicate midday, golden hour, blue hour, moonlight and twilight, I can showcase basically a full progression of light throughout the day at the same location. This can be especially helpful with generating backgrounds quickly for storyboarding as it can create backgrounds that a character is then overlaid with. In this case, I have this silhouette of a cat that I want to see placed within this river setting at various times of day. With this, I can easily 
put the images that were generated in the previous slide behind this cat character to see what it looks like at golden hour, at blue hour, or at other times of the day. Lighting keywords are not just limited to describing times of day or the lighting of outside scenes. For example, keywords like backlit or spotlight can create more dramatic lighting. However, some of these results are less successful than others. For example, in backlit, the images have a clear source of light and shadow and are quite successful in depicting sunlight streaming through the trees. However, especially for more technical terms, Dolly has a harder time understanding and translating the concepts. This can be seen in the series generated from the keyword spotlight, where there is neither a clear source of light that is the spotlight, nor is there a clear spotlight beam within the image. And overall, the images are quite muddy and difficult to identify. For generative models, we need more people with a rich understanding of visual representation to help further build out a model's visual vocabulary. Thus, animators and artists can provide their understanding of visual techniques such as lighting, colors, textures, angles, or other specific vocabulary to help sharpen AI results. Utilizing various prompt keywords allows for the generation of more nuanced imagery that can carry specific tones or emotions. This is applicable to the animation workflow as it allows artists to quickly brainstorm and test out various scenes that aid in the building of atmosphere and narrative. While these are applicable to static images, figuring out how to create simple animations, like changing the light over a continuous period of time, or one of the simplest animation tests of making a bouncing ball become not as easy to achieve. For example, when given the prompt, a ball bouncing storyboard, Dolly generates an image that has very little concept of motion over time. Within each of the frames, the ball isn't following a consistent path throughout the frames, and sometimes there's numerous balls within a single frame. Additionally, the ball looks more as if it is rolling rather than bouncing. Currently, AI generative systems have very little concept of motion and also lack a consistent narrative and motion paths when creating these storyboard images. For example, in a cat fishing storyboard, there's images of a cat, a fishing rod, and a fish. However, the ordering of the images do not form a consistent narrative and the positioning of the cat and fish are inconsistent. Thus, Animators and AI researchers need to work together to tell a greater story. Animators should be involved in the process of defining AI-supported workflows, especially in terms of non-static image generation. This could be researchers and artists meeting halfway to discuss how animators and artists convey their intent through text and sketches, and in turn, how these can better translate into prompt recognition and image generation. After all, AI tools are only as powerful as their usability and adaptability for the people who use them. And on that note, thank you so much for attending our talk today on how text-to-image AI can be applied towards animation. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us at the contact information on this slide. We look forward to getting some of that conversation between AI researchers and artists started here at Spark AI, and we can't wait to see where this dialogue can lead. Um, so hi everyone, um, thank you all for coming. My name is Ivan Aguilar. Uh, I'm the chair for the AI for Animation track and I'll be moderating this session. So we now have a Q&A session with a talk called a Text to Image AI for Animation. Um, so a recent innovation that can more directly provide inspiration to designers is Text to Image AI. Tools such as Dolly, Imogen, Party, Stable Diffusion are AI tools that help, that have the generative capacity to access and combine many visual con concepts into novel images. Given text prompts, as input, these tools can capture a wide variety of subjects and styles. In com online communities, users have already developed a number of novel me methods to elicit images with 3D qualities and create animations. 
These innovative functions bring text-based AI tools closer to end users. And, this, and in the talk that Vivian gave, we introduced, they introduced some of the applications of text to, to image AI for animation, as well as prior work that have been done in the 3D space with Autodesk research. So this talk was given by Vivian and Yingji. Um, so Vivian is a three-year computer science student, a PhD student at Columbia University and the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow. She worked on human computer interaction with Professor Lydia Chilton in the computational design lab and has previously spent time in industry working on image technologies at Autodesk Research and at two design agencies. Prefrontal cortex and all of it now. Her current research focuses on artistic applications of AI and how designers can utilize computational tools to create visual media by describing what they want. Uh, so before we begin, I'd like to inform you all that if you have any questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom and not the chat. This way we can better see the questions. And um, yeah, and you can ask at any moment any questions you have for the speaker. Okay, so to begin, um, can you give like a quick overview of some of the different ways that uh, generative AI can help, can be useful for artists? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in one of the papers that I talked about in the video, Opal, the one that is about news illustration, there are three key ways that um, the news illustrators that were interacting with our system actually use the generation. So they didn't just take them as like that final output, they could also work their own inspiration into it. So they used it as, um, as visual material, as ideas, and also sometimes they would take it as is. So sometimes when they would do some remixing, they would take sets of um, text to image compositions and then remix them together so that they could cover up the artifacts that the AI would sometimes produce. Mm -hmm. Other times they would introduce like a little bit of complexity, add some filters, um, just do things like, for example, if the image was like very red toned and they wanted something more blue toned to express something more sad, um, they would do like those types of editing. Um, at the same time, a lot of people took a lot of inspiration from um, whatever generations they saw. So if someone saw an average like 43 generations, they could say, oh, like I like the texture of this one, or I like the fact that so many nature generations were coming in. And so basically they would use it as like a reactive way to uh, gather inspiration. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, especially as you gave uh, the, the examples you gave, right, for, for journalism as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so just to give a quick background, so how long have you been following this AI space, especially for the text to image? And what do you think has changed over the time? Like how fast is technology evolving and diversifying? Yeah, so I've been following this space actually um, since last summer, and that might seem like a pretty short time, but that's around the inception of when I started. So at the time, some of the state-of-the-art models were VQGAN plus clip. And definitely the space has changed a lot because before actually a lot of the images that were produced were a lot more, um, oftentimes they were a lot more defective. You could see a lot more artifacts, a lot of um, uncanny compositions. Like for example, now you can ask Dolly for um, a dog in a CGI render style and it'll come up with like a perfect composition. But before you might get like eight different eyes, 10 different limbs, mm -hmm. um, and things were pretty chaotic. And I was a little scared that my PhD was gonna be end up, it was gonna end up being all these ugly images. Uh, luckily, more, more players came into this space. So now you have Dolly, you have Imagine, you have Party, and everybody has these very high resolution models now. And a lot of them are even seeking to commercialize. But at the same time, I think that the, the problems are still the same. Like, how do you make this usable for people? How do you make application spaces out of it? Um, and also, how do you do so? Um, but like, how do you do so in a way that is very ethical so that you're not like just like, leveraging artistic styles? Um, and how do you have like the most points of interaction so that people feel like they're still getting their creativity in? Right. Yeah, it is evolving really quickly, and especially these days. I think um, like maybe a week ago that I think Google released one where you can make um, uh, now videos as well from the yeah. images. Yeah. Um, so of all these tools that you've maybe read about right in this time, um, do you know any that are, are now being embedded into software as well? Or they, they all just standalone uses? Um, I think right now, a lot of research labs are prototyping and trying to figure out like um, 
okay, how can we apply this in our products? And a lot of research papers are coming out. I think most of the momentum, momentum is still in the machine learning space as they go from text to image, text to video. I do know um, of only one, uh, one case where in the summer, TikTok very briefly had a, um, an effect filter where it was like, okay, you could type in anything and they would get you a green screen background. So for example, if you said, I want an abstract watercolor texture, they would background that for you. Yeah, so, the, so I guess a little by little, they're starting to come into to existing applications. Yeah, but um, one key thing to know is that text to whatever is like really an inversion of everything that um, most creators are usually used to, right? We're usually used to like very fine grained uh, control um, and working with the low level details. Like if you're doing video editing or like animation, it's all about like the keyframes and like being able to move like the exact joint, right? But text to image, text to video, you don't get that local level control. Um, and you don't have all that ability to control the composition of the image. Yeah, that's actually a que another question I had, um, which is, um, do you think tools to be able to use text to image, but to give that more control are coming or is that something people are looking for? Like, like, so if you um, put, put in the prompt and you get a result, maybe you want to change just one small aspect of it. You, you have multiple things in your scene. And so like, you give an example of like the pineapple. And then if, maybe you want to change it to one little part of it or one, one part of that scene, but you, um, you want to keep everything else. So is that possible today? Or do you think anybody that's working on that? I think that there is some, definitely some work on it because that's what people want, right? Um, for example, I think that say if we're looking at Dolly, like the in-painting feature, like being able to mask part of the image that you don't like and then regenerate, like that is one way of addressing it. Um, in Opal, which was the news illustration paper, um, one way that we addressed it was we kind of relinquished control and we were like, no, just let us see a lot of different generations so that at least we get control in the form of choice. And do you know, do you think that um, when you do that, right, when you have like a batch or when you have, when you provide many generations, um, many results, do you think sometimes it can be overwhelming as well? So if you give some like maybe a hundred results, well, maybe that's, that'll take so long for them to go through that it kind of misses the point of giving them help. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a trade-off. I, I definitely I remember a moment where one of our participants was saying like, I started to like this direction, but then the pipeline that you're suggesting, which is like, then take me through all these different Im images for different tones, that took me in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely, um, there's a trade off there, but I think that right now, or at least with BQGAM plus clip, the images that were being generated then weren't good enough. So we did have to compensate by showing a lot. Um, I don't exactly know what the answer would be now that the models have improved. Okay. Uh, so maybe that's something to, to look into or to think about. Um, and what do you think about um, using these tools and, and applying it to, to, to the software that are used today, right? So applying them for the text um, or the image, image editing or to, to creating um, right, uh, 3D models, anything that can be used. But do you think there's still an issue? Is it still, the, is it still a technical limitation um, of the machine learning and all the data sets that people are using? Or is it more, there, there, are there also issues on intellectual property? Or is it also on the education of the artist that's used, the, how to use these tools and what they can be used for? Okay, yeah. So uh, that's a pretty multifaceted question. Um, the first part I heard was, um, where do we see these type of things fitting in with existing applications? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so I have some current work that is a preprint online um, and it's about 3D software. And we were looking in the context of 3D software and what we found was that um, it can definitely be embedded within any type of application. The difficulty is you have to adapt these text to image AI workflows specifically for domains. So for example, if we're talking about 3D design, um, there's a vernacular that 3D designers use, right? They talk about perspective drawings or orthographic drawings. Um, for animation, there's like a lot of different things um, that people have to understand, like a character goes into a T pose, um, and then what are like the inverse kinematics of walking and things like that, right? But how do we make sure that the text image models understand that? Because they're large and they're pre-trained, so they have all this like general knowledge, but it takes a little bit of um, thinking on the on the part of someone who might be trying to embed this work um, to figure out like, okay, how do I make it domain specific? Oh, but I do have a follow-up to the prior question. Mm -hmm. So in the prior question you asked, um, can people get overwhelmed if they're seeing a lot? Yep. Um, and what I found from testing maybe like dozens of users on these text to image AI systems 
is that they might encounter like a hundred or so generations, but because every single time they put in a different query, um, most of the times they're not, they're not exhausted by the end of it because it's more like a question and answer with the AI and they're building a good mental model of what it can do. So it's more like delight um, and less so fatigue. Right, yeah, because they're giving in, in small bits, right? They're not, not all at once. Yeah. And do you see that there, are there are a lot of talks, there are a lot of any issues about um, um, intellectual property on this? Yeah. Um, yeah, fun fact. I went to a conference last week mm -hmm. and the keynote speaker was a science fiction writer who I really admire. Uh, I went up to him and I kind of asked him, I was like, do you know anything about Dolly or stable diffusion? He was like, yeah, I know. Like a lot of my artist friends are actually really concerned that their work is going to be stolen. And like, I, I deeply empathize with that. Um, for example, like if I write with GPT-3 as a creative writer myself, I wonder like, do I really want to donate like my aesthetic language, right? And I'm sure that that's how these artists feel. I do think that there's a lot of work to be done, um, both from computer scientists as well as lawyers to protect the in intellectual property. So there's some things that the computer scientists can do. So maybe within a system, they can ban the usage of like specific artists and make sure that it can be, um, it can be like just higher level artistic terms, like use impressionism or use watercolor. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I believe that um, this kind of opt out system is exactly what fan fiction communities do. If writers don't want their work to be uh, remixed in some way, they can opt out. So that's one thing that computer scientists can do as system builders. Uh, I think the community also um, can work together to have a stronger sense of ethics. Because right now I do believe that, or at least in the very beginning, there was a lot of encouragement to try any style possible, just to like really do a battery of prompts to make sure that the that these models could do anything. Um, and then on the side of law, I believe that there are some things that we can do to protect the works of artists as well. But, um, and this is a fuzzy thought, but what if you could actually copyright embeddings um, and find some way to protect like a certain neighborhood within um, that black, spot, black box of the AI? Mm -hmm. And another fun fact or a fuzzy thought I had was um, eventually, what if enough people are creating synthetic media of like Disney or of Studio Ghibli and eventually like, you know, what if they touch Star Wars too much and Disney comes after them? I think that eventually like, things will come to a head and um, we'll have a good checks and balances there. Yeah, I think those are all um, pretty good uses, right? They're, they're things that can be thought of, right? Especially from whoever's creating it, they can have these these things in mind and maybe these um, blocks in mind so that whenever there is an issue, there could be um, solutions for it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so another aspect is, so one thing I, got, I have a question about, maybe one on the, on the machine learning side is when you're creating these data sets and you're trying to train all these um, for, for text to image, or you have all these images that you want to train, um, is it always, do you think it's always useful to go, to go, to try to make it as generalizable as possible? Or, do, or sometimes do you want to make it a smaller scope so that it's really, it, it can train very well and it's very good at outputting a certain result um, while not having to be so general? Yeah, um, I think the thing is that a lot of the advancements within natural language processing and also within um, a lot of image models is just that scale really works. And so it's not so much that they were trying to go for like the most generalizable thing. It's just that they wanted to see the benefit of scale. Okay. Yeah, and so now that they have like the basic building blocks within these models, which they call oh. foundation models, now they're thinking, okay, now should we fine tune them? Or should, you, should we just like try to leverage the pre-training as much as possible? Oh, okay. So, yeah, so they, they, they should improve it or not, or what you mentioned. I see. Um, and so, and one of the examples you get, um, you mentioned the, the, the Vicky Gang um, post clip um, and the focus on using the keywords are, are less important than actually um, how you how you structure your, um, your, your, your prompt, right? So the keywords are most important. But do you know if this also applies to other other software, or is it more for those that you tested on? Um, so I think that the the main point I was trying to get across there was mm -hmm. that these models are are flexible. So you don't have to. So when you're trying out a different prompt, you don't have to like go through all the ten different ways you could say it. And you know, because at the time I think you were you you tested on that one, right? It's on the the VQ again. Um, but do you know that it also, does it also apply to the other ones? Yeah, I believe that it applies to the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that people, 
I guess could they could take the same framework from my earlier paper and try to do another annotation study to validate that. But from my personal experience, um, using Dolly this summer, it, I think it holds. Okay. Yeah, because a lot of the guidelines you created or you guys came up with from those papers are really interesting, but it's always hard to know if that still applies as technology moves forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in one of the experiments, you also tested the range of art styles so from text statement software that could handle, um, where the annotators could analyze, the where you had annotators that analyze the results. Um, these annotators, were they um, artists? Do you, do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, they were art students. Oh, they okay. have my backgrounds in art history. Yeah, okay, that, that's what I was wondering about, because who, who was analyzing it, and did, could they critically analyze, analyze the results? Yeah. Okay. Um, so do, do text to image tools also allow for artists to... Uh, um, so you were showing one of the examples, I forgot which one it was, but for the pineapple one, right? So they would um, give it a result and you kind of erase something from it. And you would give it another prompt, and it would use that that image to to continue generating more images. Um, is that something that you see um, that's coming up in other software as well? Yeah, I do that. I do think that in painting is really valuable. Um, I think right now what we have is very like rudimentary version, where essentially what we're doing is like we're erasing. It's it's almost like scratching on a scratch card, right? But mm -hmm. I think that if we Think a little bit more abstractly like it could be used in something like photoshop which has a lot of layers you can maybe toggle the visibilities and use some layers as um, the thing to fill in um, likewise for like 3d modeling you could toggle the visibilities of some parts um, and so the idea is like okay we have some part that we've already decided with our human creativity maybe the ai can fill in the other parts yeah um and for for all these tools with text images do you know how how the how the quality is measured. So when you put in a prompt and you have a result of an image, um, do you know when they're developing it, the, the, all the tools, how do they assess the results? See how, it, how, how good is their AI to, to generate these images? Uh, that really depends on like the type of model it is. Um, some models are diffusion-based, um, others are GAN-based, like they're the concatenation of CLIP and a GAN. So mm -hmm. it's, like, for example, for a GAN, they might be looking at um, the distribution of the images. Um, otherwise, for like, say like an original, like diffusion models, I'm actually not sure, but it really depends. Okay, but they all do go do go through some stage of uh, about assessing the the results, probably. Definitely, yeah. And then they usually have these um, ablation studies where they're looking at specific quantitative metrics. Mm -hmm. um, but what we found in one of our earlier papers was that you could compare the human perception of the generations with the with like that metric and what we, what we found is that there's often not an alignment Let's see um and what do you think of the current uh what are the bring of the are the current challenges challenges that exist right now with these tools mm -hmm. um i think one of the challenges right now is that they are very good at generating things, but they're not really generating things that are exactly in alignment with what we need them for. So sometimes when the news illustrators were generating for like say an article about how climate change is speeding up the speed of sound in the ocean, it could come up with, 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 the, with a lot of aesthetic images, but that might not be the most usable, right? Like maybe that isn't the exact one that they wanna put on the front page of Wall Street Journal. Um, so we still don't know how to make them more usable. Um, and beyond that, I think it's just, there's a lot of still a lot of concern about um, when is it right to use the image and copyright concerns and things like that. Would you think that some of these tools, I know that they also allow you to, to um, use your own images to, to incorporate into a database. So you could use, um, put in a bunch of images that you, you would want and they can use that to generate new styles. Um, and do you know, do you, would you think that these, um, for example, like Wall Street or other places, they could use all bunch of cover images they have from all their different um, articles from many years and use that, put that into the system to help to help generate um, more images that fit their style. Um, are you by any chance referring to stable diffusion, like textual inversion, where yeah. a few examples? Exactly. Yeah. I personally haven't tried out textual inversion. What we've seen is like some cherry picking examples of how it works, right? Um, 
I'm not exactly sure. I'm not super confident that just by giving three examples, you can get that same effect. Um, but even, even let's say if we could get that effect, um, I'm not sure that the results would be ideal. Uh, I have this other workshop paper that I worked with one undergrad. Um, his name is Aaron Jackson. And he was studying these generations um, that were done in the Harlem Renaissance style as well as the feminist art style. And in doing a art history analysis of them, he found that they were really only surfacing like the most shallow levels of these artistic contexts. And so the idea is that, you know, say even we could, even if we could have like the most complex concepts um, that we wanted uh, gotten out of these systems, they're still making imitations of something. And so I think we should put more of our focus on how can we make text to image AI a more rich and interesting field of its own rather than continuing to try to like regurgitate past art styles. And how do, you, how do you think that could be done? Well, I think that if we explore a lot of um, the different capabilities we get from like the AI embeddings, for example, interpolation, um, or even like different animation effects, um, simply from exploring like, yeah, the embedding space computationally, mm -hmm. I think that that gives us a lot more interesting outputs. Uh, even the outpainting idea, I think that that's also a novel functionality. But if we continue to explore in the tech space and we're continuing to encourage people to try out different artists or past art styles, I don't think we're really moving the needle too much there. I see. Um, and what do you think from, from, from a user's perspective? Um, so the, the interfaces that users use and, and, and all of the options they're given when using these tools, um, do you think these are still, um, they, they are, um, what do you think about the quality of them? Don't, are, are they enough right now for the tools to put for the artists and users to be able to use? Um, from various levels of of, of skill sets, or do you think they're still limited maybe to one group or to another? Um, well, I think that these text image AI tools, like a text box, is technically supposed to democratize the ability to generate images. But yeah. I think that there's still a lot of room for um, us to scaffold the prompting process. So that's what Opal was kind of um, going for it as a research paper, it was saying we can leverage GPT-3 and large language models to help us really rapidly come up with ideas. So I think that instead of having a text box, that's pretty bare. Um, and there could be better ways to um, suggest things as you're prompting. For example, even when we do Google searches, we get a lot of like suggestions, right? And autocomplete. Um, but right now it's prompting is just like a large trial and error process. And you're kind of on your own as you stab in the dark to get your right image. Um, and do you think that that there will also be times where you could use tools together, right? So there are one tool maybe for text to, um, to image, and then you can use another tool that can um, change styles. So based on the image that you got, another one that could change the style, maybe one that can upscale the, the resolution, right? Do, do you also see this going on in the future where you use multiple tools in combination together to get your, your result at the end? Yeah, yeah. I, I've talked to an artist before who did that to try to make a magazine cover. Uh, and I just remember seeing that generation and I thought, oh, that's beautiful and creative and far better than the original, right? So I think it's um, I think it's really important for all of us to remember that whatever generation the AI gives us, that's not the full stop. Um, we as like now digital natives, we should be able to try out a lot of different workflows, um, a lot of like concatenations of applications, because that the more places where we can inject our creativity, the more I think we can say that's our own. Um, because the reason why we value art anyways is like, it's the sum of a lot of human energy. Yeah, I agree. Um, so from your experience and from what you're researching, where do you see these tools being in the future, like five years from now? Where, where do you think it, they will be? Hmm. Well, I do see them um, very useful as idea, um, as I ideation engines. Mm -hmm. um, a cute way I like to call them is like inspirational toilet paper. Um, one use case I've been thinking about lately is what if we could have text automatically create video effects for us, um, make things like video editing a bit easier. Uh, so I see that like it can make inroads in a lot of different, just a lot of different authoring software because no authoring software right now really has text as interaction. Um, so I do hope that we can have text as interaction in all different types of authoring software is like 3D modeling, animation, um, and illustration because it's far more expressive um, and fun that way. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so we have a question coming in. Um, so many of these tools specifically designed for English speakers. Um, is this like an accurate perception of this? 
Yeah, I, I understand the concern there. I got this question yesterday. Um, I don't necessarily know about like the multilingual properties of say clip uh, or the clip embedding, but that is something that can be tested. So for example, I'm not sure if this is the right audience to suggest this, but you could pass in um, certain like say like Spanish or French labels and try to match that with an image to see like, okay, what is the score of this? Um, and see if the models understand it in the same way that they understand English. But I do know that um, other large pre-trained models purely from the scale of the data that they saw were able to um, have translation properties. So I do wonder if that, if that knowledge and that, that knowledge from scale is transitive. Yeah, because it, I guess if you trained it in all these words, if you have maybe, maybe somebody come in that, that can, that is able to translate to multiple languages or maybe use a different tool that helps translate that could be fed back in and trained again and on different, in different languages. Yeah, yeah. And um, to this person's second question, how can developers work around this? Um, it's kind of to the fact of what you said and also um, echoing the Opal pipeline, you could have a large language model like GPT-3 automatically translate from your language to English and then send off the English prompt um, to the generator. Yeah, so you have something in between helping you out. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so one more question. I mean, if you guys still have questions, please let me know. But just last question to finish off as well, which is um, for those that want to get into the field of machine learning, um, maybe that haven't gone into it yet, maybe don't have any experience. Um, do you have any suggestions or any tips on where they can get started? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember being there. Uh, I remember taking a lot of... Um, I would take these like data science and machine learning classes at um, Berkeley at my undergrad. But I felt like what really helped me, because to be honest, like after my undergrad, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel super strongly um, that I, I learned all of that from, from the classroom, right? I feel mm -hmm. like I learned most of the stuff on the job or whenever I was like working in research. Um, some places that I first started off with were um, a lot of tutorials from, I remember like machine learning mastery, um, but also Runway ML. Um, specifically, I like that one because it was a software that was kind of devoted to artists. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a starting place. And I noticed that they actually have put in a lot of um, text to video and stable diffusion work into their platform as well. Um, and I think right now, uh, right now, Jupyter notebooks are really popular. So those are something that you, even as a newbie, you can get started just by having like a Gmail account and running some notebooks. At first, it's going to seem really scary. Um, but eventually, what I found is that if you just spend enough time with these things, slowly it starts, you start to like take it in like actual diffusion, like the biology version of diffusion. Well, that's great. <laughs> um, so I wanted to thank you once again for, for the talk that you gave um, and also for your time for the Q&A session. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. Thanks for um, having Yeah, of course. Um, th thank you for coming. Um, and I wanted to, before we close off, would there anything else you want to say before we close? Any closing words? Mm -hmm. um, I do think that uh, any work within the text to image AR space would really benefit from a lot of conversation between the computer scientists and animators, anyone with them, um, really anybody, but uh, anybody who will be impacted downstream by this, like illustrators and 3D modelers. So I always really welcome conversation. So if anybody has any uh, concerns or questions, like feel free to reach me at my email, which is vivian at cs.columbia.edu. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to thank you once again, and I want to thank everyone that attended today for the Q&A session. Thank you all for coming. I um, mean, if you haven't watched Vivian's talk, please go and watch it. Uh, it was a really great talk, um, as well as the other talks that we have available. Um, and thank you again, everyone, for coming once again, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Okay, yep, bye, thank Vivian. You. Th bye. Thank you.